Welcome to the Mile High Fi Podcast. My name is Carl, and we have a special guest today. My wife, Mindy, is here along with co-host... Doug Cunnington. Welcome, Mindy. It's great to see you. It's been um, a while. It has been a while. It's lovely to see you, Doug. It's always lovely to see you. Hi, Carl. I see you all the time. Hello. I mean, so, it's lovely to see you too, but I see you all the time. True. So we have Mindy on the episode today because we're talking about marriages, fire, and relationships. Pretty... Da, da, da. I feel like we should cue the ominous music because... Yeah. Yeah. So... You read all these articles on the internet, and one of the things that comes up over and over again is uh, people say that the top 10 reasons marriages disintegrate or relationships fail, and near the top is always money, which I kind of find fascinating. Have you both read these things, Doug? Yeah, I've, uh, I've heard that, and actually at our wedding, my dad said, hey, make sure you don't let money get in the middle of things. And I don't think it was from personal experience specifically, but he observed people who maybe had a lot of money and were not happy and it sort of messed things up. So it's not a really good, I guess, goal overall just to only focus on money, but it can certainly pull people apart or hopefully pull them together. The number one thing that couples fight about is money. Yeah. So I remember I was thinking about recording this podcast and I was trying to think of a good story. And then I remember you and I, we were walking in our old neighborhood and it was summertime. And one of the neighbors who will go nameless for reasons that will be revealed in about 30 seconds, they had their windows open. And do you remember this? We heard this yelling out the window, like, geez, what's going on there? And they happened to be yelling about money. I remember the husband was like, it's only Tuesday. And the kids ate all the fruit snacks and we're, we don't get paid till Friday. We should have tried to save these. Now, what are we going to do for the rest of the week? Do you remember this? And and then the wife starts yelling and like, holy crap. Yeah, I do remember this. And it was kind of an ugly fight. And I don't think that was their first or last fight about that in particular and money in general. Um, I had had several conversations with her about just, you know, talking in general. And she would she would say these things about money and how she's not particularly 100% truthful with her husband about what they're spending. And she's not because she does the money and they don't talk about it except to fight about it. And it just really made me feel bad uh, for them and for, you know, their relationship in general, because this is like a huge source of contention and there's a lot of dishonesty in their conversations about it as well. Yeah. So that might be rule number one, be open. Like, Doug, did you tell Elizabeth that you bought that fancy, like, $10,000 uh, Les Paul sign, <laughs> sign guitar? Or... Actually, uh, she'll know now. <laughs> funny thing. Well, luck luckily, she doesn't listen to anything that I do online, so she has no idea. I can literally say anything wow. here. Wow. Wow. Does it make you feel bad that your spouse doesn't listen to anything you do? It Actually, luckily, no. I'm uh. not sure why probably says more about me than anything. <laughs> we have a different dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. You don't listen to my stuff either. I know, but you get mad about it, apparently. Elizabeth oh, oh yeah. Get mad. <laughs> so, oh, back to the guitar. I actually got permission. I caught her on a good day and I said, hey, I was thinking about getting a new guitar. It'll be expensive. She said, uh, I think that's okay. So I immediately left and came back with a guitar. <laughs> that's so, awesome. Yeah. You got to act you know, quickly. So, so Doug, I'm curious, do you have a rule around that? Like we kind of have a loose rule. I think if I want to, I don't think we have any set dollar amount, but if I want to buy something that's going to cost, I don't know, maybe 50, a hundred bucks, something significant, something stupid and frivolous. Like I'm trying to think noise canceling headphones. I think I ran that past. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to buy a new pair of shoes. They'll probably be like $90, which hurts me a little bit. Do you have a rule, Doug, where you run something fast or you just... Uh... No, n nothing specific. Kind of like you said, probably if it's over fifty hundred dollars or so, we'll like mention it just because, I mean, that's a little chunk of change. I mean, that's a fancy dinner out or something like that. Um, but when I was single, I would spend on dumb stuff all the time. Actually, I think this microphone that I'm talking into, like I didn't really need it, but I bought it, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Turns out it's uh, come in handy here recently. <laughs> but yeah, I would just buy, I'm like, oh, that looks kind of cool. I will just buy that. And it would maybe be anything under $500 I would buy. Okay. How much was the microphone? I think it was like a hundred bucks or so. Oh, so, okay. so nothing too crazy, but I also got like the 
couple other accessories. So, I mean, and that's how it goes. You get one thing that's a hundred, a couple other things. Next thing you know, you're walking out $250 worth of stuff or so. Sure. Guitar center. <laughs> guitar center. Guitar Dangerous. Center. <laughs> guitar center has some really great microphone stuff. I didn't realize that until I was looking for one locally. And I'm like, really? Guitar center? I thought they just sold guitars. Yeah. They um, got it all. So, so I have a different view on that. Um, if I am buying something for the family, like groceries or, well, probably just groceries, maybe something to decorate the house. I don't necessarily run it by you, but if I'm buying something for myself, I just double check. And it's, it's not because you have ever made me feel bad for buying something. It's not because you have ever said, well, you have to check with me before you spend any money. It's a respect thing. We combined finances when we first got married and- it's our money. Why would I be disrespectful to my life partner by not just running it past him? Hey, do you mind if I buy this or I'm thinking about buying this? And have I ever told you no? I don't think so, but I have told you no or I've gotten upset. I was just thinking of an instance, but... Oh, I was going to say, you've never thought. told me no, but I guess I have revisionist memory. What did you tell me no about? I have never said no, but... So I gave myself a haircut earlier this week and how I gave myself a haircut was with a wall shaver. So I bought this thing like 10 years ago. It was like $18. It's a great, great device. The thing never breaks. It just works. I spray some WD-40 in it. So if I smell a little bit funny, it's not <laughs> BO, it's WD-40. So I've probably given myself like 180 haircuts. So that thing is, what does that come down to? Like 10 cents a haircut. You came back from getting the haircut, and I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Oh, you were yeah. surprised at what it cost, too. You weren't expecting the haircut to cost this much, but you told me how much it was. And I think you had some coloring done or something like that, too. But yeah, how yeah. much did that so, come out? And, and I remember you didn't tell me that I asked you. Yes, no, and, I did not uh, volunteer that information. And I could tell from the look on your face that you were not eager to tell me what it cost because you were surprised, which is probably a good thing. So what did that cost? Well, before I answer that direct question, I am going to preface this by saying <laughs> that I very rarely get a haircut, like once every six or nine months. I am not at the haircut place frequently. I don't care about my hair. I throw it in a ponytail all the time. Like when it gets really, really gross, then I go get a cut. So it's super infrequent that I do this. I don't spend this kind of money every, like what did the hairstylist say? You should come back every six weeks. No, I don't have the time to come back every six weeks. I, do, I don't do anything every six weeks. Um, but I went for a cut and a color and I went to my, uh, friend who is a master stylist. She is really, really, really good. She works in Boulder, Colorado, which is what the most expensive city on the planet. It's super, super, super pricey. Um, and I got a really great haircut and I got amazing color. But it cost me two hundred and thirty-five dollars. Wait, was that before the tip? I yes. Don't... Oh, oh, that hurts. <laughs> You'll get over it. Oh. it. It did look good, though. <laughs> it looked really, really good. I had that haircut for a super long time. The color grew out in a way that didn't have like roots, so it was a great experience. But when I got the quote, like, I didn't ask how much is this going to cost before I went in, which is mistake number one. And then it, I was just, like, kind of shocked. Like, wow, that's a lot of money. Um, this is not even the first time that happened to me. When I was in high school, I went and got a perm. And I thought it was going to be, like, 50 bucks. And it was, like, 125 And this was pre-credit card. So I had to call wow. my mom to come and give me money so I could pay to get out of the salon. So, um, yeah. I still go to this stylist, but my hair is like brownish. It's just going to always be brownish. And I guess not brownish. It is brown. Um, so I don't get color anymore. The cuts are still really great. Um, they last nine months long and they're more like $60, and, which I'm fine with. And for the record, I have volunteered to cut your hair, which I would do for completely free. For the record, you will never touch my it, hair and with we, scissors. We could do it for the Clippers, then? We could do it for the first time on a future recording of the Mile no, High Five podcast. No, <laughs> that will but. never happen on the Mile Five High Pi Five, whatever podcast. <laughs> it rolls off the tongue. Well, that, 
Yeah, that's amazing. I, I have heard about these things called haircuts before, and I I heard they can be expensive if you don't look out. They can be, yeah. But I mean, I, that was my fault for not asking how much is it going to cost. Right, and, and they probably, I, I imagine. They frown upon it when you walk in. You're like, how much is this? Because, I mean, there's not like a, a menu on the wall with like the prices, like a, an oil change and Yes, whatever. it is not a super cuts where it's an $8 haircut or fifth, maybe they're $15 now. I don't know. There, but. there is one really good thing about this place, though. I took there. She volunteered to give the kids a cheaper haircut, which was still a lot. But I go there and I bring the girls in there and she's like, do you want a beer? I'm like, what? She's like, yeah, we've got a cooler back there full of beer. I'm like, just free, like a beer? Like, what kind do you have? And they had all these like micro brews. So she's like, yeah, I'll, I'll get you one. So, oh man, I know, it's but it still wasn't worth it because you that, could buy a beer pretty cheap. Yeah, that beer was like 70 or $80 between the two haircuts. So, yeah, I could buy a lot of beer. No, for that much. the beer was free and the haircuts were 70 or $80. Yeah, that's how they get you in. Well, one thing you mentioned to kind of bring us back on track is combining finances. So Elizabeth and I have separate finances and we share a credit card and everything else is separate. So all our retirement accounts, all of our, well, I guess those would be separate anyway, but um, our other investment accounts are all separate. So can you talk about combining finances and any logic behind it, or that's just the thing to do? Wow. So this is going to sound super judgmental just after you say we're all separate. Well, we're together because, and I, uh, Derek and Carrie had this book called One Bed, One Checkbook. And I thought that's a, that headline is, or that title of that book is a really great concept. My parents are still married. His parents were married up until his father passed last summer. And we, Both of our parents had always combined finances. So it's kind of what we knew. Um, And when we got married, we went on our honeymoon the next day. And then we came back a week later and started the process of transferring all of my stuff to his accounts because he had automatic withdrawals and I didn't. So I just moved everything over to him. Um, But it, it never occurred to me that you wouldn't combine finances when you got married And I always, I actually was super judgmental for the longest time, but then Brandon, the mad scientist, explained why he and his wife don't combine finances. And it made a lot of sense um, because she is not as phi focused as he is. So she doesn't want him to, it's been a long time since I heard them discuss this. So she doesn't want to run purchases past him. And she has her own job. He had his own job. So they've just, it's always worked for them. Um, My biggest, the biggest question that I get from, from people is, well, if you don't combine finances, how do you handle the shared expenses? Like you both live in a house. Does one of you own the house and one of you doesn't? Do you both pay like half of all of the major expenses? Do you each throw a thousand dollars into the pot every month and then just pay the shared expenses that way? There's a lot of ways to do it. And other things, other things that I've heard people do is uh, they will each get play money. Like I get one hundred dollars, and if I spend it on the dumbest stuff at all at possible, you can't say anything. That's my hundred bucks, or I can save it up and spend it on something really big and dumb, or you know whatever I need. And I think there's another reason for it, and that reason is you just don't give a shit. For example, you forwarded me your new four hundred one k information this week. I'm like, well. And I think you expected me to do something with it, like, hey, log in and and choose our investments or whatever. You didn't even know what your login was. I didn't know what my login was. We just changed a bunch of stuff. And I'm in the middle of like a big project, so I didn't really pay that much attention. It was more like, hey, do you see anything in here that you want me to choose as the investment? Let's talk about this. Because you are – is obsessed the right way to phrase your – your love of the stock market and reading, like how many trade publications do you read every day it, about it, the stock market? Whatever is beyond obsessed. My obsession goes to yeah. 11. So, but, and <laughs> you don't really care. Like, I, and I'm, it's just the way our, we function. Like, it, uh, it is your deepest <laughs> love outside of me and the girls to read up on the stock. I mean, he's talking, he, we'll just go for walks and he's like, Oh, Hey, they asked me about the cues today. Okay. <laughs> 
I don't know what that is. <laughs> QQQ, it's a NASDAQ oh like top God, 100 you're ETF. Regret saying that. We'll, we'll have a show on it, but I'm curious to hear your take, Doug. So we do it this way just because it works for us. Mindy doesn't really care to manage the money. I log on and pay the credit cards. I'm obsessive about that too. I do it probably once a week. Like when the due date comes up, I want our balance at zero, but I'm abnormal and I really obsess over our investments, even though I don't change them that often. So, and you don't really care about that, but I'm curious to hear your take, Doug. Why do you separate your finances and how, what happened if one of you uh, were really good with your finances and then the other one, maybe you, Doug, um, shit the bed and uh, you were broke. Would Elizabeth step in there and help you out? Not that that's going to happen. Just a hypothetical situation. I always wonder about that with these people who separate their finances. Because I imagine you two are both pretty good, but there's probably a situation where one person might be a... Stock market superstar, and the other is like, "Hey, I need a new Tesla or whatever." Right, it's right. Financed at ten percent. So I think, honestly, I didn't have a strong opinion on it early on, or I guess right when we got married. And I think, good thing Elizabeth doesn't listen to the show; probably won't. <laughs> she, I don't think she trusted me with money. And it was only been recently, probably in the last couple years, where she was like, okay, you have a handle on things. And she's just really conservative financially. So I had a little credit card debt. I had um, just bad habits. I wasn't saving as much as I should right when we met. And I saw the light. She helped me out. She was like, okay, like, look at it a little bit differently. So I'm back on track. Every, everything is fine. And it has been for a very long time. But when we had it separate, it was, it was just cleaner overall. And we track um, expenses and pay expenses s- sort of evenly. It's not an exact even split. So I pay the credit card bill for shared household expenses, covers food, um, any anything else we could put on credit cards like cell phone bills and those kind of things. I pay some of the utilities and then she pays the mortgage here. And that's kind of how we had it set up for a few years as we've purchased homes and stuff like that or lived in apartments. So it works out roughly even. I think I might be paying a little bit more because I'm paying the credit cards. And when you buy a house, you buy a bunch of stuff to go along with it. So, So that's how it works generally. And we track our Actually, we don't even track our full net worth. We don't consider like the home or cars or anything. So we're just tracking our assets as far as money in the bank or investments. And it's it's surprisingly roughly pretty even overall. Do you feel competition? Like, do you ever uh, do you ever compare? Does it ever devolve into that? Or I, I do. And and when I won't go into too many specific details. I, I definitely do. I don't know if she does, but we had a sort of a bigger transaction and a couple things in play. So I made the full down payment on this house from my account, which is, you know, is over $100,000, right? So a decent chunk. And she's ahead of me um, just by about that amount. So I view that as I should be ahead, but there's nothing I could do now. You know, I, what am I going to do? So I'm losing, basically. Hmm. That's a good story, though. I like how you said that Elizabeth kind of whipped your ass into shape. So if you, I'm picturing your life now, I can see it right now, which is pretty frugal. You're not a uh, excessive person, but I'm kind of trying to imagine what your life would be like if Elizabeth didn't come into the picture. Like instead of having that old Ford F-150, would you have... What's the big one that we saw? Like a Ford F four fifty, like a hundred thousand dollar truck with oh uh, jacked up. And no, I'm just kidding, Doug. I don't think your wife would ever go to that extreme, but maybe. <laughs> so, one story that. Sorry, was there anything else on combining or not um, having joined finances? I think if somebody is going to, they're getting married or they're partnering up and going to live together, um, they need to have the money conversation. And we never had the money conversation, but we also kind of didn't need to have the money conversation because we both, I mean, you, you, you get context clues. Oh, wow. He's got an older car. So do I. He's living in a house instead of paying rent. Me too. There's, there's a lot of things that you can just notice when you meet somebody and start to, you know, become enmeshed in their lives. Oh, he's got a brand new BMW. 
it's pretty, but I don't, you know, I don't identify with that. Or he's got brand new clothes all the time and a phone and all the things. And it's been a really long time since we were dating. I don't think we even had cell phones when we first got together. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, that's actually a really good segue because early on, you got a very big context clue on your first date with Carl. Do you remember that? And yeah. I had actually forgotten this and Mindy brought it up <laughs> like a year or two ago. And I, and I was kind of horrified actually, but yeah, let's talk about it. You should tell Why that. were you horrified? I don't know if I would do the same thing now. I don't, I you guess I should. Because you're not dating anybody now. Well, no. Okay. No, let's, let's tell the story yeah. then. Talk what would you it. do on a date? Let's talk about that. No. Okay. Back, back to your first date. Okay. So we had known each other for like six months. I... I think I'm going to skip the part of the story that I normally tell. We had known each other for six months and we finally, he finally asked me out on a date. And we go to this barbecue restaurant. I love barbecue food. And we went there and it was called Russell's and they have barbecue sauce that's like vinegar based instead of sugar based or whatever the other option is. And that's awesome. their barbecue sauce was kind of gross. So I was a little disappointed in the food, but he used a coupon which I was not disappointed in because why would you pay full price when you don't have to? Um, and I was reminded of this when I saw some woman tweet, I was on a date last night and the man pulled out a coupon. Pff, next. And I'm like, and then her, her comment was, her tweet was filled with comments. Send him my way. I like a good man that knows how to manage his money, you know? So I was like, oh yeah, my husband used a coupon on the first date and now we're married. Um, it's not, anything shameful to try and save money why would you why would that be looked down upon i don't understand that um well i'm worth full price okay great he can spend money on other things if he saves it on your meal because he's got a coupon i don't understand why anybody would look down on that and you're saying you wouldn't do that now that was a pretty big indicator that i wasn't some gold digger i mean i wasn't you already knew that but talk about the people that you worked with at that time yeah i guess i i still would a coupon i still would use a coupon now and i get a unusually uh, what's the word i'm looking for i get a, a probably unacceptable level of excitement when those like package of coupons come in the mail every week and a lot of them are like buy one get one free they used to have a shoes and brews one like buy one beer get one beer and so we just got yeah. a few of those yeah 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 that's so right <laughs> so no matter how much money we have like saving a dollar off something gets me unusually excited but i get you, you know what i still would use the coupon because i think anyone how excited I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> show me the coupon <laughs> yeah I, I think mindy alluded to the boss i've told the story in a, in a past podcast who I was driving. It wasn't a bad car. It was like an old Eagle Town, but nothing special either. And she had bought a new BMW. And she's like, Carl, if you want to get married, you need to upgrade your car. You should get a, a BMW like me. I'm like, well, why do I need to do that? She's like, well, if you want to find someone, you need to prove your wealth. And this is one way to prove it. I'm like, well, I can If you kinda... want to find a gold digger, you would need to prove your wealth. I can see her point a little bit. You want to make sure someone is financially solvent, but... I mean, that car could prove you're financially insolvent as well. There's other ways to find it. Like if you're stealth wealth, how do you how do you prove what you've got? And when do you disclose that, which is another thing like. Uh, that is a really good question. And when do you prove your stealth wealth? You don't have to prove your wealth to anybody. People should not be dating you because you're rich. People should be dating you because you're a good person, because you have things in common, because you're interesting, because... Oh, but you I don't, don't want someone to be paid. They could be all those things, which is great. And I agree with you. But you don't want someone. There's plenty of people who I'm sure have great hearts, but are still probably pretty rotten with the credit card. So, But you can fix being rotten with a credit card. If you're a terrible person, you can't fix that. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, speaking of that money conversation, did you guys have a conversation before you got married? Or when did that come into play? I don't think we've... Well, it, okay, so... Pre-2012-13, we never really had money conversations because it we just are both frugal. Um, after he started his blog and became really entrenched in the personal finance community, we don't stop having conversations about money. And our kids are like, we don't care, mom. I'm getting a Q's tattoo next week, by the way. No, you're not. Yeah, Q, Q, Q. <laughs> you can get a tattoo. 
But you're not going to. I, I don't want a tattoo that's too expensive. You you have enough for both of us. It's not too expensive. But, so the question, Doug, was did we talk about money? And I find that amusing because, like I said, I'm, I'm obsessed with it now. And I kind of was back then too, but it just never came up. But I don't think it was intentional. It just... I think you've we've had this conversation before, and I think you had a good point in that we already kind of knew. Like, I brought the coupon. We both had bad cars. Yours was a lot worse, which was worse in a good way. Like, wow, that thing is horrible. How awesome is that? <laughs> <laughs> so awful. Yeah, it was pretty awful. And then what you follow, followed it up with was similarly awful, that cigar smelling. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Toyota Tercel or whatever that was. So. Well, we didn't have the money conversation, I think we both knew we had the same values. But yeah, we really should have talked about it beforehand, especially. Have we talked well, about it? Well, what would we have said? I'm frugal. Yeah, me too. Okay, next. I don't like know. There's... We probably could have talked about our long-term plans maybe. But who the hell knows what you want to do when you're 30 or how old were we when we got married? Something wow, like really? I don't know. 29 and 28. God, it's almost 30 years. Holy crap. It's not almost 20 <laughs> years, 20 years. years. <laughs> 20 years. Oh, my God. You're losing a decade there. <laughs> yeah, he's about this to is, lose This is the key else. on my glass now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is interesting. How about you, Doug? Did you have money conversations? Obviously, you knew that you were going to split your finances beforehand, so you talked about something. I, you know what? I don't distinctly remember having any big conversation about keeping finances separate or joining or anything like that, but I think with some of our conversations about um, either credit card debt or my house that I owned at the time and a couple of those other little pieces. I think Elizabeth knew I didn't have my shit together completely. Context clues. Yeah. And, but it was frugal cause I lived in a really shitty house and had kind of a crappy car. So, I mean, I checked off those boxes, <laughs> but, but it wasn't as organized. And, it, and I was actually going to ask you guys, I mean, yeah, when you're 30 and, you know, hopefully we're putting money away in our 401ks and some other things, but we don't know how much we're going to need to have. I was just following the advice of, um, you know, a couple insurance agents selling me some bullshit uh, products, right? That's pro another topic for another day. And, um, but at that point, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I started that whole sentence. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't know what I was going to say, but yeah, it's, a, yeah. <laughs> I think the thing is when you're young, like we didn't know about fire or anything like that. And so I gave a lecture this week to students at CU and they're kind of interesting because these kids are like, most of them aren't even drinking age yet. And they know who Mr. Money Mustache is. They know what fire is. He's these, uh, some of them were talking about quitting their job and going to Portugal before they even turned 30, but we didn't know about any of that. So I knew about Portugal. Yeah, we knew about Portugal, but <laughs> not only did we not talk about these things, we didn't even know about them to talk about them. It was just back then, I think retirement was so far away, we didn't consider anything like that. So these conversations would have been that they never could have existed. But we did talk about what we would do with our retirement accounts, like how much we're going to put in there and we're going to max it out. But that's probably as far as it ever got from an investment standpoint. And then maybe cars and stuff like that. And by the way, I, I have to throw myself under the bus a little bit here because I'm harassing you for getting your $235 haircut plus tip, which I gave you a lot of shit about. And I told you like a year ago, I'm going to buy a Tesla for like $50,000. And, and you're like, oh, okay. So much cooler. Yeah. Much throw, cooler than him. Th throw me under the bus. Don't throw <laughs> Mindy under the bus or under the Tesla. Well, and I'm going to go on a little tangent here before we keep pushing through here. With the fact that you've retired a couple years ago, and I mean, you're still working, of course. Yes. And your finances are much different than when you first retired or even when you started thinking about retiring early and stopping work. At this point, you do have more flexibility to even go pay cash for like a 50000 or a $100,000 car. And it probably won't effectively make any difference in six months or six years or in 60 years if you live that long. So are you adjusting your sort of threshold of like what's acceptable and maybe spending a little bit more being less frugal? Or is that so deeply within your sort of way that you operate? I think that we are still cheap as hell. 
we will always be frugal in that we're not going to buy things that we don't really care about. We are spending more money on quality items rather than just buying the cheapest thing because it lasts longer. He spent $100 on a pair of Keen shoes and wore them pretty much every single day for, what, two years? Yeah, I think so. Two or three years? That's really good. All these cheap shoes that you buy, I bought a pair of shoes for 20 bucks. I could wear them like once a week for six months and then they were falling apart and I had to throw them away. So who got the better deal here? Well, he did. Um, I have the Keens too, so. The, but One interesting thing is I think we might be more frugal or at least be it. This isn't necessarily a good thing. It might be to my detriment because now that I have, I won't say an infinite amount of time, but now that I don't have a job, I can sit there. Hey, we're going to go to... San Diego, let me spend like six hours on the computer trying to save a dollar on the hotel, which I've learned isn't an effective use of my time. Or, hey, the coupons are here. I'm going to look through all these where when we had a job and kids, I probably would have thrown them in the garbage due to lack of time. So, okay. But yeah, I think we're as. uh, Let me tell you, let me tell you a little story about Mr. I want to save 20 bucks over here. We were flying from Denver to Jacksonville, Florida, which is on Southwest, not a direct flight to, but there's a direct flight back. So anyway, I only shop on Southwest by nonstop flights. If there's not a nonstop, I'm not going there. Um, So he booked our reservations. He always does the travel because he's very good at it. But he booked our reservations from Denver to Minneapolis to Chicago to Jacksonville, Florida. We saved $20 and it cost us like, what, six extra hours? I think we might have saved twenty five dollars, or maybe been thirty per ticket. I mean, it's not just twenty dollars total. It was twenty dollars per ticket, <laughs> but it, no, it was not twenty five. It was twenty. It was January. It was beautiful in Minnesota, the Twin Cities at that time. <laughs> okay, I quit you. <laughs> so, I told him after that flight, I'm like, we are never flying this way again. <laughs> we'll go direct to Orlando and drive, or I mean, Florida only has like nine thousand airports. We can find something real close. So, my Time is more valuable than twenty dollars, and having having that mindset is actually really freeing. But you have to get to the level where you can afford to overpay by twenty bucks on a flight mm-hmm. to save all that time. Um, when we were in our twenties, that would have been fine. We had a lot of time. We had more time than money. But now we have more money than time. And that's something that's a phrase that actually comes up a lot in our daily lives. He'll say something and I'll say, we have more money than time. Just go buy it or, you know, pay the extra for the thing or Mm -hmm. whatever it is, because we, you know, you can't get your time back. Why would you spend so much time doing something when it's not going to make a difference in your overall financial situation. Like when we were first starting out and had a hundred thousand dollars of net worth, buying a fifty thousand dollar car would have been fifty percent of our net worth. That's insane. We're not buying a car now that costs fifty percent of our net worth. I would definitely have a conversation about that. <laughs> but a fifty thousand dollar car in the long run doesn't dent us at all. Mm-hmm. Yep, frugal habits die hard. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know what your original question was, but there you go. That's perfect. (laughs) Well, I want to underscore something you mentioned and you highlighted it really well too, Mindy, but Elizabeth and I have a similar kind of issue, I guess I'll put it in quotes, not not a horrible issue. Elizabeth is an optimizer, so she will try to get the best deal or find the best VRBO and She'll spend a whole lot of time researching and thinking about it and spending all this brain energy on it. And I think she must enjoy it some, especially when she gets the deal or finds the perfect place. But it turns out if I book something, I'll spend maybe a tenth of the time. I'll quickly look, see what's available, find something that gets us 80% of the happiness or value that we need, and we're good to go. And I I just booked... um, some stuff for FinCon, right? So we're all going to FinCon, right? In Austin. And I, in the past, would have looked around for cheaper hotels and maybe tried to walk or other stuff. And I was like, forget it. I'm just going to get whatever I can get right now. I don't want to think about it anymore. I just want it booked. 
and then we're good to go. And we're talking about, you know, 20, 50 bucks, like here or there versus convenience, which for me, I mean, I don't want to have to walk up the street really far or any kind of nonsense like that. I just want to be, um, in the spot where everyone else is and just not think about it. So that optimization is tough because it's, it's, there's satisfaction with it, but yeah. Do you do that with other areas? Like try to optimize? Yeah. I, I've tried to cut back on that, but mostly travel is the big one. But, uh, when I'm driving around, I'm always like, okay, I just don't want to go to home Depot. Like, let's, let's think of every place I have to go. And then I think of the most optimal way to drive there to minimize the left-hand turns. And then I think of what oh, time God. I need to go. Cause I don't want to go after four cause everyone's off work and traffic and, there's going to be lines at the store, so I need to go like at one o'clock in the afternoon. I've learned like optimal times to go to Home Depot. Like Home Depot, like nine to ten a.m. on a weekday is beautiful because all the construction people are done. They've gotten there earlier. You don't have the lunch rush yet. So, yeah, it's crazy. But I'm with you, Doug. Like after a while, and it took me a long time to arrive at this. Probably only very recently, but it's diminishing returns. Like now. So I was booking a hotel for a trip I'm going to take. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to find one with a good rating at this location. And, and I think I pulled the trigger within about 10 minutes because after that, how much more are you really going to gain from? I want the free breakfast too. They got to have some some form of free breakfast. But after that, I'm not really going to gain anything from clicking through all these pictures, like 30 pictures on Airbnb. Like, oh, look at that. There's the pillow shaped like a cat or whatever. So I... You Lurches. booked a hotel in 10 minutes? Yeah, can you believe it? No, I can't. It's awesome. And I look at price too. So you, you use filters. Like filters are very important in life. So I don't want to pay this much. It's got to be in this location. It's got to have this kind of review and then just see one that looks good and click the picture. That is really click important. So like I said, I don't fly nonstop. I don't not fly nonstop anymore. That's a horrible mm -hmm. phrase. But I don't even look. Of course, the stopping in 50 places is cheaper. I just click nonstop only. And then mm -hmm. I look at what times they're flying. I could fly at 5.30 in the morning, leaving at 5.30 in the morning and save $10. Or I could pay $10 more and fly at noon. So I pay $10 more and fly at noon because it isn't worth it to me to get up super early anymore. I don't sleep well on just a general basis. So when I have a flight at super early in the morning, I'm always nervous that I'm going to miss my flight even though I've got an alarm set, I will sleep very poorly yep. that entire night. And, you know, waking up every five minutes and looking at the clock and, mm -hmm. oh, I've got to, you know, I've got to get up and I don't want to miss my flight. It, first of all, the worst thing that happens is they just put you on another flight. Um, but also, I can't believe you spent 10 minutes booking a hotel. I know. You're growing. That's great. We're yeah. getting breakthroughs. But, yeah, um, but the filters is really great because then you see that there's another flight available for, you know, half the price if you leave at 530 in the morning and stop in seven places if you put the filter on right away. If it's yep, like so. $100 more, we're still buying that. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll take a quick pause from the interview to talk about our email list, the Mile High Fi Club. And Mindy, have you joined our email list yet? Of course I have. I support my husband. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so you've joined the Mile High Fi Club. Nice. We appreciate your support. Yeah. And in this email list, well, it's our newsletter. So we'll send out an email like once or twice a week. We actually, at the point where we're recording this right now, we haven't sent anything out, but a few people have signed up, which we very much appreciate. But we'll let people know when new shows come out. And a couple other things, like I think we're going to have um, maybe some products or stories or books that we're thinking about. And are you reading any books right now? Uh, what am I reading right now? Um, the Subtle Art of Not Giving a F. F. Um, that's one. I, I get like halfway through books, then I lose my momentum. So I got to pick that one back up again. Okay. But how about you? Do, are you reading anything right now? I'm just reading John Grisham books right now. Okay. Very good. Which one are you reading currently? Do you remember the title? Um, I just finished up The Guardians this morning. It's about uh, wrongfully convicted, a, a guy who was wrongfully convicted of murder because of a corrupt uh, sheriff. And it turns out that it was based on a true story, which is kind of sad. Mm. So there's a nonprofit. Wow, I really wish I would have known that I should have taken notes when I was reading this. There's a nonprofit that helps people... Um, 
fight their convictions when they're wrongly, wrongfully prosecuted uh, or wrongfully convicted. So I um, am going to go do some research on them and and uh, maybe send them a few bucks. Cool. Yeah, I read I'll a lot. Talk of, to you about that. <laughs> I was going to say I read a lot of fiction as well. I think I read more fiction than nonfiction right now. So um, I'm reading one called "The Bangtail Ghost" by Keith McCafferty. And it's set in Bozeman, but they call it a uh, Bridger. It's like the <laughs> fictional town. So it's like a crime drama situation. Pretty fun. I read a lot of books like that. So cool. That's one thing I've learned to let go of in financial independence too. I used to be obsessed with reading nonfiction, like economics and stuff like that, just because I felt reading fiction was a waste of my time. But uh, yeah, I've been able to let go. And although I can't remember the last fiction book, I read a Stephen King book recently reread a Stephen King book. I will say that it is 100% okay to enjoy your life. You don't always have to learn something from a book that you read. It is absolutely fine to read for pleasure. You're not going to make me give up coupons, are you? No, I'm not going to make you give <laughs> okay, up coupons. Okay. I'd have to draw the line there. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I mean, I used to read all these uh, productivity books too, because you feel like, oh, I got to be so productive. But then no, you don't. Yeah, you, you can take a day off and do nothing. Yeah. 100% have seen that in real life and you will not explode. And I'm speaking to you, mister. <laughs> He's like, he'll be working on the house and he like runs to go get something. Why are you running? Because I don't have much time. Because the coupons came in the mailbox and I know they're there. And I'm <laughs> running to get them. Did well, you hear that? It went like this. <sighs> Okay. Coupons. <laughs> really love them. I'll, whenever you come over, I'll have some out just uh, scattered on the counter and just let you look at them for a few minutes before we come down. Ooh, here. I appreciate that. Doug. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the backdrop where the insulation is over there. I'm gesturing for the people listening on the podcast only. It's sort of industrial down here, but maybe we could do a whole wall for, full of coupons that have expired. Kind of a, I mean, not, not good ones. We don't want those good ones to expire, right? Matt. Yeah, there's always a lot of, there's very few good ones that you actually want in there. It's like one out of 20 are actually decent. Like, let me clean your All carpets. Like, stores. no. Yeah, the liquor store, shoes and brews. Um, yay, yeah. shoes and brews. Yeah. Not an ad, but we should talk to him. That'd be a good person. Shoes They're and brews is a sponsor of today's episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving back in. One of the most common questions that we've seen I've discovered fire. And I'm on board, but my partner isn't. What do we do? Get a new partner. Next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, this is assuming that they are married or in a long-term committed relationship. Um, this is a question that I get a lot too. And it is, uh, it's, it's a tricky one because you have discovered this. Clearly you are super excited about it and you want to tell the world, you want to, Tell your spouse or your partner and, you know, let's do this. What they are hearing is usual. I mean, people who discover fire are usually uh, fairly frugal to begin with. Not always, but I think the person who's discovering it is looking for it and is already doing some or most of the things involved in, you know, being frugal and financial independence anyway. So when they approach their partner their partner doesn't hear them saying, hey, we could retire early and spend a lot of time together. Their partner typically hears them say, you're a spendy person. Everything you're doing is wrong. I want to cut out all the fun and be super, super frugal in a way that will make your life miserable. What do you say? And it's, you know, it's the way that you phrase it in the beginning that's really going to be the most helpful. You know, I heard of this thing. I've been reading these these articles about fire which is financial independence retire early and people are retiring much early than age 65 and they do this by making small tweaks in their life small tweaks to their spending that don't really affect what their their happiness levels and they're investing in index funds to you know grow their their nest egg so that they can retire earlier than 65 and then spend the rest of their lives leading the life that they want. And that's a way better way to phrase it than we got to stop spending so much money. 
because it feels like an attack. And even when the way that I phrased it can still be heard as a bit of an attack on the way that you spend your money. So um, the the documentary Playing With Fire, in the movie, he said to his wife, because he had discovered financial independence, he said to his wife, what are the like your top 10 favorite things or what are the 10 biggest things to you? And she listed all these things and in the top 10 was not spending time at the beach or living near the beach, but they paid an enormous premium to live near the beach. And when he pointed that out to her, she's like, oh, you're right. And it wasn't an attack on her. It was, hey, I have asked you, what are your big things? And you have given me your big things. And this very expensive part of our life is not on your big list. So let's maybe revisit where we live. Let's revisit all these things that aren't on your your big list. And first of all, I think it's a great uh, documentary. And I think anybody who's listening who has not watched it yet should watch it. Do you know where they can find it? I think it's on Apple. You can buy it from whatever Apple's streaming services. Yeah, we should include a link in the show notes. Do you guys have show notes? Yep, we will, yeah. We should have. So they will have a link in the show notes to the movie, the documentary called Playing With Fire. It's also a book, which you can find on Amazon, which they will also list in their show notes, <laughs> which can be found at milehifi.com slash show Mindy or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so, something like that. There'll be a link. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> I'd like to build on what you said. I once heard... I was on a panel in FinCon and someone asked this very question. And my answer was the same as yours, find a different partner because it's uh, it's pretty hard. But it's not really a question about money. It's a question about values and what your goals are in life. So Leif Dahlin, who blogs at Physician on Fire, he was an anesthesiologist who retired, I thought had a great answer. And this builds on what you said with the documentary about the 10 things you want out of life. And I think what she said, none of the 10 things she wanted had anything to do with money was, I want to spend time with my family. I want to raise good kids, blah, blah, blah. And Leaf said something like, you should ask people what they really want out of life. Like, not where do you see yourself in five years, but what do you really want out of life in 10 or 20 years? Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? And I think very few people would say, oh, I want a mansion on Miami Beach or something like that. They would say, I I want to raise good kids. I'd like to be able to travel. I'd like to be able to see the world. And a lot of these things don't require money or they require you to, if you're going to really live those dreams, they're going to require you to save up the money and retire earlier so you could enjoy life before your body is old and decrepit and in rapid decline. So I think if most people think really long term, they're not going to say, oh, I want a BMW 7 Series or whatever the hell the top version of that car is now. Uh, they're going to say, I want this and this and this out of life. And those things don't necessarily cost money or they cost a little money. But what they do cost is time. And then one way to get your time is to save your money now so you can afford to liberate yourself from your job and live that life you want. But it's a very difficult question because hey, <laughs> you, you discover fire and your partner is – it has no idea. And most people I find still don't know about this. Like I think most of our family still thinks we're crazy weirdos, which is a, would probably be another interesting thing to talk about. Most people just, I'm, I'm not trying to be judgmental, but most people don't live like this just because they haven't heard of it. You're taught to work, you get a promotion, you can upgrade your car, you can upgrade your house, then you get another, you get another promotion, recycle, 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 do this over and over again. Um, not many people do what you're doing. So when you throw this at someone, it's going to be a big shock to their system. And you can't expect to throw this at someone and have them on board overnight, except you, with who you are on board overnight or instantaneously, which was still kind of shocking. But when I told you about fire. Yeah, well, I don't think I was on board instantaneously. I think I've always been a frugal person. And you were working at a job that was causing you so much stress. It was hard to watch you go through that and see you be so unhappy. And, you know, we were making a really good salary. We, we, he was making a good salary. I was a stay-at-home mom, but still contributing. But anyway, um, you were making a really good salary and you were unhappy. More money wasn't going to make you more happy. More money was probably going to make you less happy because it was going to make you more stressed. So when you said, I can... You know, I just discovered this thing and and we can, you know, if we save up some money, I can quit my job. I'm like, quit your job now. Go find another job. You can 
you can always find another job, but to spend so much time in a place that makes you so miserable to the point that you're losing weight because you can't eat because you're so stressed out isn't the best choice. Yeah. Uh, and I appreciate that you let me do that. And I really appreciate my life now. It's wonderful. But Doug, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. I know you and Elizabeth have discussed the fire life. And I know she's a little bit more, as you alluded to earlier, a little bit more conservative than you. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember when we first really looked into it deeply. I think we found uh, Pete's blog, Mr. Money Mustache, um, just because of money we needed to invest. We didn't know where to put it. And I didn't trust these uh, insurance agents anymore. So we're, we're looking elsewhere. I think we found, you know, one of the classic posts the of the 4% rule, the something simple math. Pe- people the shockingly know. simple math behind the 4% rule. It's a good, good title, good yeah. headline there. So I think we found that started investing and it was probably a few years later um, when I heard Pete on Tim Ferriss's podcast and at that point, I was already, I, I may have been laid off at that point in doing my um, internet marketing gig that I do now. And I was slowly like adopting that mindset of like, oh, we can retire early. I'm doing well. We have been saving. Like I got my things in order a few years ago. And the issue that we've had is I, I'm looking at our expenses and I'm looking at how much we have been spending and I'm, I see, Hey, the math works out 4% rule, but again, she's more conservative. So she may be looking at, well, some of these articles say that 4% is too aggressive, maybe 3%. Of course that changes the math by 25%. It's kind of a big deal. And we've been, you know, debating and going back and forth, but, um, luckily, I enjoy what I'm doing. She is still working. And once you kind of hit some critical mass, um, time will be your friend and compound interest just works out. So slowly, I mean, I'm patient anyway. And I've, again, I'm still working. I'm actually making more than if I had a job and it's much easier and more fun. So what, what what's funny? Yeah, I'm making more than if I had a job. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And I could phrase it that way. And, you know, you mentioned um, earlier about not being busy all the time. And I, I get, you know, so many emails per day. Like we probably all do since we have audiences and, and people that pay attention to us. So I get a ton of emails and there's a lot of like little things that we could spend time on. And I'm like letting more and more things drop. And I don't have to reply back to every email. I mean, when people are asking me for stuff. If it's someone in the audience asking a question, I want to hear that, of course. But it's very interesting as you can make yourself as, I mean, busier than you have time to complete it and everything, or you can like scale back and just say, oh, some stuff is going to slip through the cracks here and it's going to be okay. So the job that I have now is pretty fun because I'm the boss and I can kind of like let things, let things go and I don't have to put so much stress on myself, but it's really hard because I hate seeing things unfinished. So, yeah. So the big tangent, uh, eventually we've worked things out because of compound interest in time. It just, it works. And it seems like Elizabeth was the kind who, even if she never knew about fire, she would have ended up that way anyway. She would have ended up with a bunch of money, even though, and and there are people like that. And I think we're kind of like that. I guess we had a big house. We were a little bit spendy for a small part of our life, but mm-hmm. still we were always frugal. So there's some people who don't need to pivot. They're just naturally frugal. Elizabeth sounds like one of those types of people. So. Right. Well, but the problem that like if we didn't f- find Phi, we probably just would have saved and we'd had a fuckload of money <laughs> and just realized, oh, we could have retired like 20 years ago and like not given a shit about all these other decisions that we really thought about you can just i mean it's a very luxurious position i realize that but yeah at some point we hopefully would have realized but it maybe would have been much further ahead and we would have stressed out for years for for no reason that's awesome i'm picturing doug here 
on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Do they still have that show? Or MTV Cribs? Do they still have that show? Like landing in a helicopter on his mansion up in Telluride or something like that. Doug walking out with his full length mink coat on and snowboard or something like that. That's what your life could have been if you hadn't discovered fire. Instead, now you're sitting in your basement talking to us. Yeah. Maybe you should go back to work, Doug. Uh, well, I guess you're making more money now. So, Doug, I think that vision I painted for your future is going to happen. And I hope you don't forget about the little people when it does. I've yeah, never I been in a helicopter. Coat. I'd really like to take a helicopter, right? In your future <laughs> helicopter, Doug. They're, they're so expensive, but we can see if there's any coupons out. We've spent so much time talking about coupons. I can't even believe it. Do you have like some good techniques? Maybe we can have another show where we just talk couponing. Yes. Here's No, it doesn't even have to be another show. <laughs> Save coupons for things that you buy on a regular basis or restaurants you go to on a regular basis. Put them in a little box. And then every time you're thinking, oh, maybe we should go out to a restaurant. See if you have a valid coupon in there and use the coupon when you go to the restaurant. And if you forget it, don't beat yourself up. And this is actually a pretty stupid conversation because, well, I the key word here is I enjoy it. It's stupid to try to save like a dollar or two when you've got... No, it isn't. Why would you want to spend an extra dollar if you don't have to? But if you could spend your time doing something else more value, valuable than looking through this you don't crap even have that a comes job. in the mail you looking at coupons... You can do so much. God. It's okay to spend 10 minutes going through the, the coupons. Doug, this is so sad, but there was one day, I, I can't remember, some new business opened up and they had sent everyone like a free coupon for a small pizza. And I remember a lot of neighbors had just tossed it into their recycling bin. So then... Recycling day came where all the bins are on the side of the street. So I'm just going by everyone's thing like, oh, and I think I harvested a couple of them. I know I got one from the next door neighbors. Harvested. That's the right word. And, you know, there was a whole story how he gets his clothes out of the trash. That was one of the previous episodes. So I think there's a thread, a very weird and strange thread. He just got two by fours out of our neighbor's garbage they were not only are they two by fours there's old two by fours though so our neighbor is recycle uh remodeling something in the house and we walked past they had one of those bagsters mm -hmm. uh, which is like a small dumpster like fabric dumpster that you put in your front yard um and in the bagster was a two by four and I'm like, we should look in there and see if there's two by fours in there. See how long they are, because we've got more building projects to do. Two by fours have gone up in value, uh, gone up in price. What four, four x over yeah. the last year yeah. because everybody's building and there's. Oh, so, cow. um, we went over. We finally went over and looked. We walked past it like ten times. We went over and looked, and we got what ten? Yeah, Eight or ten. Yeah, I think so. Full size two by fours, old two by fours from the seventies when they were straight and stayed straight forever. Plus, and they have some nails in it. Okay, well, we've got a grinder. Just grind those off. That'll be easy. Um, plus a bunch of smaller lengths that we can either use for framing out windows or throw them in the wood pile for the uh, for the fireplace because they're just plain old wood. They're not treated or anything. Um, so, yeah, it's totally fine to pull it out of somebody else's garbage. If it's at the curb, it is fair game. And why would I let that go to the landfill when I can reuse it? Um, we are getting way off topic, but I wanted to go back to that 4% rule and getting your spouse on board and all of that. Um, Elizabeth is more frugal and wants to do the 3% rule. I actually read Bill Bangan's 4% rule in the Journal of Financial Planners, and it's a fascinating read. I'll send you the link. It's a PDF, so link to it in the show notes because mm -hmm. it's really, really interesting. He did this in, was it 92 or 96? It was a really groundbreaking study that he did. He's friends with Michael Kitsis from Nerd's Eye View and Michael Kitsis took his research and then a, like 20 years later, redid it and said, oh, not only do you have like a 96% chance of success, in many cases, you have so much more money after 30 years than you even started with. You're actually now in you know, you're getting into RMD territory where you've got all this money, like $10 million. You start off with 1 million, you're spending and withdrawing at the 4%. And in 30 years, you have 10 million. So you have 10 times the amount that you made or that you had, plus you've been living off of it the whole time. He extrapolated this all out. And there was one case, one section of time where the, the money ran out. And it went negative. And that was retiring in the late 60s, early 70s, when we had that huge period of inflation. 
And it's not so much the stock market, he said, but it's the the inflationary period right after your retirement that can really cause your your uh, money to dry up. But he's got this huge spreadsheet and very complicated looking graph where you start off and it's like everybody just basically goes up and to the right. It is this massive amount of money that people have after 30 years. Um, I'll send you a link to that article that he had on his, on his post as well, uh, because it's really interesting. It's like uh, when he first found the Mr. Money Mustache website, he's reading through, he's like, what is this guy trying to sell? This is a bunch of crap. Yeah. But he kept reading and math doesn't lie. Two plus two is always four. It's never not four. So he's doing this this reading and, oh, okay, let me do some math. He's the researcher in the family. And he keeps reading and he's like, I can't find a loophole in his, in his uh, math. I can't find an error in his math. This isn't incorrect. Bill Bengen is a really smart guy and he figured this out. It's, he, he's now saying that, yeah, you could probably get by with like 5 6%. Maybe even seven percent withdrawal rates. So, so people who are going to the three percent, if that's what they need to make them comfortable with the decision to retire, great, go for that number. But the math shows you that four percent rule is just fine. As long as they're not buying two by fours. As long as you're not buying two by fours <laughs> in this current market, which is insane. But so I mean, it's just it's fascinating. If somebody isn't going to believe that you can do this. It doesn't matter how much information you share with them. They will f- poke holes in it. And, oh, look, this one time they ran out of money. That's one out of like 75 different scenarios. So yes, it can happen. There is no guarantee, but it's really, really close to guaranteed. So, you know, I would just say continue to read and educate yourself because there's some really, really smart people out there who are doing the math and running the spreadsheets. Michael Kitsis shared his spreadsheet with me and I'm looking at it. I'm like, I'm not even going to, I just <laughs> glanced at it and it is just a wall of numbers in an yeah. Excel document. I'm like, that's a lot. That's a lot to take in. I'm not even going to try to read this, but it's really fascinating, the, <laughs> the graph. So um, I wanted to share that before we got off topic, which we already did. So, <laughs> yay, coupons. We yeah. got off topic by getting off topic. <sighs> but very well said, and we'll put links and and details so people can read the original stuff there. All right. Moving, or should are we ready to move? Yeah, I think so. Let's talk about fire, discovering fire in marriages. Could fire destroy a marriage? Da, da, da. Cue the ominous music. Bum, bum, bum. So I thought this, uh, a lot of times you read these articles about, hey, this couple fight, this couple fired, and now they're traveling around in this camper van or they're living in this tiny house in the middle of Idaho. And the thought that comes to my mind was, okay, these two people were, were working. They probably spent three or four hours a day with us, with each other, because they had this job, they might even have kids, which makes gives them even less time together. Then all of a sudden, they're going to stop working and they're going to be on top of each other 24-7, no job. And I don't think that's always a good thing. And I think about it with their own relationship because when I had a job, my mind was preoccupied with a lot of the crap that goes around a job. Even after you clock out for the day, you're still thinking about that. Then all of a sudden, you don't have a job and you're like, oh, Look at all these other things going on in my life that I might have been unhappy with before, but I was suppressing because I didn't have the time or mental willpower to deal with them. Maybe now I is the time to deal with it. And before I go on, I think this makes you a better person too. Strip your job, strip your life of your job, and you'll really see who you are. I think J.D. Roth said something like that. If you really want to see who you are, I think he said like your naked self, which is kind of weird. But anyway, uh, fire, be fired, quit your job, and you'll see who you you really are, that naked version of yourself or whatever. I still don't know what that means. Dog, I do not want to see you naked. Please don't take it that way. But I, I'm, I'm actually offended. Why, why not? <laughs> our next pod, okay, our next podcast, the- uh, The X-rated oh, yeah, version. Yeah, NC-17, whatever they call it now. Mile high five after dark. Yeah. Mile okay. High. Keep going. Sorry. Oh, some black bars. Um, I would need a small one, but um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> and there it goes. There goes the episode. But anyway, so after I left my job, I realized I wasn't happy with a lot of the the things in our life. Uh, for example, the state of our house. We were always at when I left work was about the same time you went back, so we had zero time. 
At the same time, we were rehabbing a house and we've got two kids on top of this. What the hell were we thinking? Just me saying this right now, but I don't know. So our house was always kind of cluttered and besides all the construction, we didn't really have time to keep up with anything. And we still struggle with that to this very day, but it led to some fights. I wasn't happy with the way our house was and our lifestyle was. And then I guess I had the time and mental willpower to fight and to worry about these things. So yeah, I've wondered if fire, and, and there's a couple people, I don't want to say names, but I, I think I could think of one person in the fire community. And I don't know if he's ever come out and came out and say this, and it's not the living AFI guy, although maybe him too. Yeah, him too. Like fire kind of mm-hmm. led to his separation. Doug and I talked about that a couple episodes ago, how she wasn't happy. And then, I'll bet if they would have kept working, they probably would have stayed married. And that's not necessarily a good thing because they found out who they really were and what their values were. And it turned out his values were different than hers. I'm not passing judgment on either either of them. He preferred not to work. She preferred to go back to work. And it was irreconcilable. It led to some um, behavior that led to the termination of their marriage. And I can think of one other person who I think that's probably happened to, although I'd be speculating, so I don't want to say any names, but what what do you think? Could fire how could fire be a bad thing in a marriage? I or a good thing? Is it mostly a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think like you said, it depends on the people involved in the marriage. If you are happy in general in your marriage, then fire isn't going to change it. We had a period of adjustment and we did have some uh, tense discussions about things. Um, I would invite you to clean up the house anytime you want uh, with your no job situation right there. <laughs> Feel free. Um, but, you know, the way that our marriage had been working was changing because I didn't work. And then, and you did. And then we both worked, which was horrible. And then I worked and you didn't. And we still had the same expectations on ourselves of when you worked and I didn't. So we needed to go through a period of adjustment. I think the key to any strong marriage is communication. If you want your spouse to know something, you have to say it because they cannot read your mind. And if you want to know something from your spouse, you should ask it because they can't read your mind either. So, you know, having a conversation is always going to be the best thing for your marriage. And I think the living a fi, again, not passing any judgment, but he even said, maybe I could have been more, more forthcoming with my questions or, you know, asked, taken it a little more seriously, or he was so happy in his not working life that he didn't even pause to think that maybe she wouldn't be so happy. And that doesn't mean that either one of them is wrong. That just means that they needed to have more communication. So can merit can fire destroy a marriage? Sure, but lack of communication is what's going to destroy the marriage. It isn't the fire that's destroying the marriage. And, and I don't think a dissolution of a marriage is necessarily like whatever we think of a divorce. It's usually one person has done something bad, or there's some kind of nefarious actions going on. But not in all cases. I think you could just realize that your values are different, and you'd be better off without each other. I, that's probably not frequent, but. I think maybe in the case of Mr. Money Mustache, that's probably what happened. They realized they were different. I know they still talk to each other. They get along. Their lives, they just became different people. And they weren't reconcilable with their past, with who they were in the past. So you go your own way and you're better off for it. It's much better to to do that than to try to save a sinking ship and you'd just be unhappy and it would probably end anyway, but probably end on much less uh, good circumstances. Well, but a marriage will dissolve, can dissolve without fire throwing in there. Like you, you meet when you're 20 and you get married when you're 25 and you continue to grow. And sometimes you grow together and sometimes you grow apart. I'm a very different person than when we first got married, but we have grown together. And the disagreements that we had right when you quit your job didn't break us because we didn't, you know, we, we had the communication and we talked it out and and we, you know, uh, I don't know where I'm going with that, but we were fine. But other people will grow apart regardless of fire in their life. So fire is not the reason that the marriage is dissolving. It might 
be the, you know, gasoline. That's, oh, I'm, Scott would be so proud of me. It's <laughs> gasoline, gasoline fire, the good fire. one. <laughs> <laughs> it's the gasoline on the fire that makes the marriage break up. Um, you know, it's, it, it might be the, the accelerant, but it's not the reason that people mm-hmm. are getting a divorce. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like people have, uh, issues perhaps couples have issues and when you strip away a lot of the distractions like a job you don't have anything left like i think the point you were talking about you know being naked your naked self whatever whatever um keep your shirt on whatever paraphrase that you you left us with there in that great visual the the thing is you you strip away everything else you can't be distracted so it exposes whatever is going on or not going on or passive aggressive communication which is my preference versus the <laughs> the more direct route um yeah, yeah that makes total sense so there, there's nothing to hide behind if you have all this time freedom you're, you don't have to worry about your finances anymore so it makes total sense yeah and one final thought about this is We've talked about this a little bit. We talked about it in uh, in last week's episode of Jail College. Is everyone needs meaning. Everyone needs purpose in their life. I can't imagine there's any human out of the 7 billion people on earth who would want to sit around in a tiny house with me 24-7. That would be – that whatever relationship happened would go – would go up pretty quickly, would go up in flames pretty quickly. There's the flames thing again. <laughs> the tiny house would burst into flames. So – even after you fire, if you're a couple, I think you should consider how you're going to live your life and how you're going to spend your time because you just can't spend your time uh, like those Instagram people. You see, oh, we're hiking in Southeast Asia. I guess you can spend a little bit of time doing that, but I don't think that's a recipe for long-term happiness, just living in a camper van, taking pretty pictures all day. I think uh, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I don't want to do that either. I would do it for a little <laughs> bit of time, but I need to be writing, creating, doing something that would drive me insane. And I would drive the other person insane if they had to be around me 24-7. Well, I think we can probably move on to some of our key takeaways. Before we do, though, how do you find someone who is in alignment with your values? Any specific tips on where to, to pick up um, people that are into fire? Join some of the groups. There's a lot of meetup groups. And now that the world is starting to open up again, there's more in-person meetup groups. Choose FI has a like local meetups in, I think, every state. Um, multiple in some states when they're real big states. Uh, but just look around for a, a similar group. If you don't have one near you, start one. There are frugal weirdos everywhere. Um, I don't want to just sit here and plug everything, but Bigger Pockets Money has a Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash BP money. And there's a lot of frugal weirdos in there. Um, there's there's uh, meetup.com has events. Just start talking to people. And, you know, when you do go on a date, talk about money. Maybe not the first date, maybe the first date. I mean, if you know that you are looking for somebody who is on the same page, put that out in your profile. Internet dating started right after we started dating. So I don't really, I've never done it. I don't know how that works. Um, That is a great point. So here is, Doug, on a, a couple episodes ago, we talked about side hustles. And I don't think anyone has done this yet. Although I know it's been talked about, a dating app for frugal people oh no there is one there is Uh, one okay oh god it's not your april fool's joke is it no bigger pockets (laughs) bigger pockets love no that was an april (laughs) fool's joke from scott (laughs) this is uh oh god i'll have to look it up and give you the link in the show notes it's like fire dating or something like that um it's it's just starting out there's not a ton of people on it yet but um I mean, yeah, put that in your profile and let your friends know, hey, you know that I'm a frugal person. It's not like something you can hide. You know I'm a frugal person. I'm looking to date somebody who is frugal, who likes to go hiking or loves skiing or like all the things that you're looking for and, you know, put it out there that you're that you're looking. But I think it's yeah. easier than ever now because all these meetup groups. So if you go to a Mr. Money Mustache meetup group, we've got our own meetup group right here. We're going to have our 
Ocho de Mayo party. If you go to something <laughs> like that, mm-hmm. the people attending that probably aren't going to be – they're probably going to be frugal people who enjoy Mr. Money Mustache. So you've got a lot of the stuff out of the way right there. You're, you've probably got some – Significant overlap in your Venn diagram and your circles there, but yeah, mm-hmm. fiery dating app. I don't think I've ever heard of that. It's not, yeah, it's that's not a great a idea. STD app like fire in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, edit that out. <laughs> it's very lightly edited, so a lot of this makes it in. So I, I, I wonder, I wonder what they, I wonder what I they have that's for, for uh, redheads. <laughs> I wonder what the dating app is like. I'm curious to see it now. Not that I want to date, but... Yeah. How single do you have to be? <laughs> it is it isn't like a... Because there's different dating apps. Now they've just got hookup apps for people who just want to do not Hook pass up. go. Just go right... Yeah. Go right to you know what. So I wonder if they've got a version of that on there. Or, and I, I wonder what the questions are on this dating app. This is really intriguing. I don't, like, well, let's what, go figure out what the what it's actually called. So, and is there like a net worth thing on there? And, what kind of? I think there are a lot of questions. Wow. Surrounding like a lot of uh, filter questions surrounding money in general. Okay. So if you say you've got a certain car, it just boots you out. Like no fire, <laughs> no fiery dating for you. You're you're out of here. Yeah. I, I guess it could have an opposite app. Is there a gold digger app? There, there probably is for people who just want to find too. a spouse with a, with a bunch of money. There's uh, like sugar baby, sugar daddy connection sites D- does that go both ways is there a is there a sugar mama what's the opposite of a sugar daddy i guess a sugar mama is the opposite of a sugar daddy okay. and the um but a sugar baby can be either gender okay so this is interesting i'm curious to look at the fire dating app and see how many people are on there did my husband just say he's curious to look at the fire dating <laughs> I, app? just because i want to help him say that? i want to help out our audience i want to help find frugal mm-hmm. singles find other frugal singles it is kind of Sad, like we go to these things all the time, and there's young, attractive people who have a lot of who have a lot of money, hard working, and they're like, oh, "Where do I find someone?" Like, there's definitely a market for it. Totally, yeah. And you know, people think that fire is really heavily weighted in men, and I think that's kind of true. But there's a lot of women out there who maybe just haven't heard of fire and would love to be able to date someone who's got their financial mm-hmm. stuff in order. Yeah. You know, I've thought about that a lot too, and it seems like men were overrepresented, but I don't think there's any less women involved. And we've got two great examples here, Elizabeth and you, both frugal ladies. You're probably just not as outspoken men to be mm-hmm. men tend to be more I don't think anybody who's ever met me has said I'm not outspoken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, exception for you there, but yeah, I think I think uh, you're right. Early on, I think there were a lot of men kind of out there talking about it, but there's a lot of women that I see around and I think it's a lot more diverse now as well, which I think you you mentioned that specifically. I mean, you've been in this um, community for a lot longer than I have. Yeah. And it isn't that women aren't welcome. It's just, I think it's more of a uh, product of women in general are not braggy people whereas men tend to be more braggy which is a horrible way to phrase it they tend to you know accentuate their accomplishments and women tend to play it closer to the best and i know that's being totally generalization and i said it they didn't don't blame the boys testosterone causes a lot of problems (laughs) (laughs) okay i and i think um the the in-person meetup groups are pretty awesome. Just I've gone to several of them at HQ. Looking forward to the one in a couple of weeks here, and yeah, they're they're pretty fun. And occasionally, yeah, you do see some single people that pop in. Maybe they come from Fort Collins or Denver, and then they kind of they find their way to a corner and stuff like that. I've seen that happen at the the few events I've been to. So it's a good filter, great huh. filter. Have they find found their way into the tiny house? We'll have to give them the code and, and let them know. Yeah, yeah, put some up. <laughs> Uh, this is a joke, you know, as co-owners there, we should be clear about that. All right. Moving on for our key takeaways and kind of wrapping it up. I'll, I'll send it over to, to you, Carl, here, and then we can just kind of roundtable it. Yeah. So these discussions are always funny to me because money is kind of a superficial, shitty thing. But I think the main point with all this and with finding a spouse is money – it's not about money. It's really about our values. It's really about our goals. It's really about what we want out of life. And money is just a reflection on that. Money is the tool. 
how we get to that point in life, what we really want. So we say money is so important and it, it kind of is, but it kind of isn't because it's really about those values. It's really about how we want to live our remaining years on, on our little planet here. And so how we, what we do with the money, what we do with this tool is, is very important and what we should talk about. But at the same time, it's not important at all. It's the values and making sure we're in alignment when we find our, our partner. So. That's really well said. I'm not even sure what to add to that. Mindy, do you have any? I don't have anything to add to that. That was really great. Good job, sweetheart. Yeah. Thanks for being on our podcast. We appreciate it. One plug for you. You've got a, a new book coming out. Would you like to tell the I have a new book about? already out. It's very timely too. It's called First Time Home Buyer: The Complete Guide to Avoiding Rookie Mistakes. And uh, my podcast partner, Scott Trench, co-wrote it with me. And it is... Uh, the complete guide to avoiding rookie mistakes. There are a lot of things that you need to know when you're buying a house that maybe your real estate agent doesn't tell you. Maybe you've never thought about it in a different way. So Scott and I took our collective 35 years of buying and selling real estate and put it into a book that is easy to read. It's a fun read um, and really informative, gives you a different way to look at purchasing a home. And they can also find you on the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, kind of our competition, maybe a little bit. <laughs> you can find me on the Bigger Pockets Money podcast every single week, twice a week. We come out on Mondays and Fridays. And you can find me all over biggerpockets.com. And there is plenty of room in the personal finance podcast space for the Mile High Fi Club. Thanks. Welcome to the personal finance podcast space. We appreciate you saying as much. Hopefully we can be on your podcast someday. What episode are you on? Um, I just recorded episode 197 okay. yesterday. Oh, geez. How many have I been on? Oh, wait, I can count. I'm sorry. How many have you listened to? <laughs> More than I've been on. You were our test guest. Remember that? When we were testing the, the concept? It's okay. Your podcast is better without me. It's higher quality. I, I would do nothing <laughs> but bring it down. And that's why you're here, so you can bring us up. Dinosaurs and fart jokes. There's a lot of fart jokes. A lot of fart jokes. Yes. And actual farting sometime, too. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> On that note. Yeah, what an odd way to end. Actually, I have a real question. So, new book came out. Um, you and Scott worked together. What was the collaboration process like? How did you work on it and write it? We sat down together and decided on the outline. This is what These are the topics we want to cover. And Scott said, I'm very passionate about this part. And I said, I'm very passionate about this part. And he said, I want to cover the middle. And I said, I want to cover the middle. So we each wrote our own parts and collaborated on the middle. And then um, had an editor come in and we have very different writing styles and we have very different personalities. And our editor came in and kind of melded them. And so all the content is from the both of us. And the writing style has been altered a little bit so it doesn't make so much, so it's not super clear who wrote which part because we both believe in all of it. And, you know, we wanted that information to be there. But um, also the writing, the writing process was, hey, here's your deadline from the publishing company, which is Bigger Pockets Publishing. Um, here's your deadline. And I'm like, oh, I can totally do this. No work. No work. Oh, I should write something. So you open up the file. You're like, tappity, tappity. Oh, I got something else to do. And then all of a sudden you're like, my deadline is next week. And I've written 27 words. Oh, no. So um, it, it was definitely a little stressful towards the end. I would not recommend the method that I did. But it was a lot of fun to write. And I really, really enjoy the book. I'm super excited that this information is out there because nobody tells you how to buy a house. They're just like, how much can you afford? Great. Let's go look at houses in that price range. And, you know, maybe that's a great idea. Maybe that's not. In general, it's probably not the best idea to buy. Like you're qualified for 500. Great. I'm going to buy a $500,000 house. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, things to think about that we bring up in the book. Awesome. Very cool. Well, thanks, Mindy. Really appreciate it. Doug, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Carl, thank you for having me too. Thank you, wife.
<laughs> wife. Spouse, partner. We'll, we'll do Hello. some talking. Well, are you guys nervous? Have you recorded a show together before? We've recorded some shows together. Yeah, we have. We've been on a couple different interviews, so this is nothing new. Although we're kind of the focus of this one, or you are. So this, I guess we were in the past, though, too. So this isn't that much. I'm not different. nervous. I'm a pro. You're a pro. How about you, Carl? You seem nervous. I'm tired. I don't know. I didn't. I thought I slept well last night, and uh, I'm so mad at you. I didn't. I didn't you wake were supposed up feeling to get rested. all your sleep. I got plenty of sleep last night because he has been harassing me this whole time. Like, the, <laughs> do you want to come on our show? Sure. Oh, you've never had me on your show. <laughs> uh, and then he's like, "Are you are you prepared?" I'm like, he's like, "Have you have you been preparing?" No. <laughs> I just show up and talk. Just that is the beauty of it. You just show up and talk. And I, I have to compliment both. Well, I, probably you. You're here almost on time, which is amazing. <laughs> yes. I it, it uh back this up. I have not been on time at all. I don't think. Did you notice that once. with him? Like he's always there's one time that he is on time, and that's when he has scheduled something that uh for the HQ. He's like, we have oh. to go. We have to go right now. I'm like. A lot of people we are literally that. late to absolutely everything because of you. 100% your fault. All right. I shouldn't have even opened up the can of worms. I was just kidding about the nervous stuff. You seem fine. But, you know, that's how we open up usually for the uh, the sound check. We make fun of each other, typically. Oh, I am on board with that. <laughs> some, Most of it's going to be Some good singers. Carl. Yeah, it's, it sounded like it. It seemed like it. Okay. To me, it sounds like Carl is a little bit quieter than us in the headphones, which I could just, I could turn it up. You don't have to adjust. I just, Mindy, um, do you hear the same? Uh, yeah, I am quieter in my own headphones, like my own voice. I can't really hear my voice that much, but it's not too bad. I'm a very either. loud person in general, so I will always overshadow him. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just because okay. I'm super loud. Yeah, we should be able. Okay, Carl, before we go on, where are we hiking today? I just want to hear your your side over there. Uh, we are going to take... Oh, it sounds better now. It's yeah, completely it's much different. louder. We are yeah. going to hike in Golden, Colorado. All right. Do you know the name of the trail, the mountain? That was such a boring answer. I do not know. It is in back of Chris's house, I think. He yes. lives like on a hiking trail, which We're is kind of crazy. A oh. What? What? You, Why are you throwing me under the bus? We are going to hike in Golden, Colorado. Well, he's doing the sound check. I'm trying to. Yeah. So you just like loosen up and hey, we're going to hike in Golden, Colorado. It's right by Chris's house. Oh, my he God. Lives, like you told me this fascinating story about how he lives on this. Like he backs up to open space and it's this amazing trail and he's got amazing views and blah, blah, blah. If you want a pen. Thank you. I don't know if you need to. I'm you probably won't need to write anything. I probably won't. I'm going to put this down though so that sure. nobody can. Oh, they can still yeah. see it. Well, That's like, I think I may have um, the editor like make this very wide screen, although I'm much higher than Carl over there because we slouchy. don't have a professional uh, studio here. I'm sitting in a lawn chair here. Okay, <laughs> I think that's pretty good. We can get rolling here. <laughs> 